Hey everyone, welcome back again. Good to see you guys. Uh, yeah, it's about two minutes or a little under two minutes till class time. So for now, we're just getting the stream going. So welcome back. Good morning, Leah. Hope you're having a good morning so far. Hey, Janice, good to see you too. Gloria. Good morning, good morning. Hey, philosophers, how's it going there? Hope you're all having a good week. Hey, it's Peachy. Mm -hmm. Good girl, Peach. Good morning. Angel, Jerry, Paula, Mia, Alexis, Sheely, Allison, Brittany, Nathan, Sophia, welcome back. Just a couple moments and we'll get things started. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Good to see you guys. Okay, it's basically 10 a.m. now, so I'm going to let things get started. Welcome back, all. Um, so basically, the plan today is we have part two of our meeting on utilitarian ethics. We got that started on Tuesday and just have a couple of notes to, to wrap up with that lecture uh, today. And then next week when we return on Tuesday, the 2nd of March, um, we'll be talking about another ethical theory that we can compare against utilitarianism. So let me just kind of bring you slowly back into the topic that we were covering. Um, welcome back, everybody. I see you guys there. As usual, do uh, type in a comment at some point so that I'll get your informal record of attendance established. And yeah, so let me make a couple of points of review. We're now in the middle of talking about ethics. This is the second topic in the semester that we're all studying. Ethics, you know, is the study of morality and moral concepts. So the realm of moral concepts include concepts like um, right and wrong, good and bad, moral and immoral, just and unjust, virtue and vice, how a person ought to act as opposed to how a person should not act. Um, when you judge an action, a practice, or an institution in either of those different ways, then you're engaged in moral judgment and moral reasoning. Um, we also, I think after that, talked about how there are three main categories of action in, um, in ethics. Let's see, just quickly in the chat to get a little feedback from you. Um, what are the three main types of actions in ethics, if anyone knows or remembers? Let's just see that one time and I'll comment on it for a brief moment. Three types of action in ethics. We've got what, what, and what. Okay, good, Leo. Morally impermissible, that's one of those. Mm -hmm. And versus what else? Morning, Brandon. Morally impermissible, morally permissible, and morally obligatory. That's right. Yes. Good job, guys, and thank you. So about those terms, um, morally impermissible means that the action is wrong morally, and it's not okay to do. So doesn't mean it's impossible to do. It just means that it's wrong morally to do it, like killing, lying, cheating, stealing, um, rape, torture, genocide, so many terrible things that you're never supposed to do that you shouldn't do. Unfortunately, some of these things can and do happen, but they're wrong, okay? And then on the opposite side, there are actions that are morally permissible. And we said that those are actions which are not wrong and they are okay to do. Now, some of those morally permitted acts are very righteous and noble, virtuous, like helping save people's lives if you're a firefighter or donating money to charity or being a surgeon um, who skillfully helps people uh, 
improve their lives or remove their ailments. So yeah, those things are virtuous and noble, but it also includes a whole realm of actions that are just not wrong. You know, like, like me petting this cat is, is morally permitted, even though I guess it's not to anyone else's necessary uh, advantage. Um, me wearing this green polo is morally permissible, but it's not an obligation. Okay, so morally permissible acts are just things that cannot be claimed as wrong or blameworthy. And then the third category, morally obligatory. Morally obligatory actions are the actions that you must do, and it would be wrong not to do them. So those are morally required rather than optional. And um, so, like, not doing the morally impermissible things would be one case of what a moral obligation is. Consider, for example, not killing, not lying, not stealing or cheating. Um, you can also generate moral obligations through the act of promising, like if you promise or vow or swear to do something, then you're morally obligated to follow through on that, even if you're not necessarily legally obligated. We also talked about the difference between morality and law. We should not confuse the concept of morally impermissible with illegal, nor should we confuse the concept of morally permissible with legal, because sometimes it's possible for the laws to differ from what at least some would argue to be moral principles. Um, in a system where slavery is allowed by law, it's arguably uh, clear that that's still immoral. It's morally impermissible even if it was legally permitted. And sometimes people think that there are actions which are not in themselves wrong, which are forbidden by law. Like, for example, um, maybe recreational drug use or maybe the freeing of slaves back in the era of slavery, etc. So anyway... The system of ethics and ethical theory is when we try to determine what principles make an action either morally permissible, impermissible, or obligatory. So that's where we started to try and fill in the details of how utilitarian ethical theory works. Now let's see if someone can add that to the discussion. What's the basic summary description of utilitarianism as an ethical theory? What kind of thing does it say that you, should ought, to, that you ought to be trying to do um, when you make decisions and take actions. Hi, Adrian and Ketan and everybody else here. I see you guys. Appreciate your attendance. But um, one quick question. Yeah, what's the definition of utilitarianism? And then from there, we'll continue the review, and then we'll get into the new, new notes for today. So what's utilitarianism mean? Because that's the major topic here. Mark, do the action that makes the most people the most happy. That's one way to say it. Yes, Janice. Always create the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest amount of people. Good. Okay, so what's the moral obligation for utilitarians? It's to do whatever would create the most overall happiness for the greatest number. So it's a consequentialist type of ethical theory. Consequentialist ethical theories say that it is the consequences that matter towards defining the morality of your action. So in utilitarianism, the specific consequences that we care about are those that bear on overall human happiness. And so you're directed by the theory to take whichever action will generate the most overall in comparison with the other alternative options. Um, why would it be that promoting happiness is the greatest um, standard to live by for ethics? Mill gives a couple reasons. He says, well, consider this principle called the greatest happiness principle. The greatest happiness principle says that actions are right insofar as they promote happiness and actions are wrong insofar as they promote the reverse of happiness. Happiness, you may remember, is defined precisely as pleasure and the absence of pain. And the reverse of happiness is defined as pain and the absence of pleasure. So the greatest happiness principle just says that the more pleasure that your actions cause, or the more pain that they take away, to that degree they're better morally. And on the other hand, to the degree or extent that your action causes pain, or takes pleasure away, the more of it that that causes, the worse it is morally. And he backs this with one further underlying principle, which is the notion that happiness is the happiness or pleasure is the only thing that we all pursue as an end and not as a means. So one last quick point of review. What are these words refer to? Means and ends. What is an end and what are means? Who could let me know about that? And then I think that'll be a good review of last time and we'll continue from there. So I'm just asking about those words, means and ends, because they say, utilitarianism says, that pleasure is the only thing that all of us are looking for as an end 
and not as a means. So let's go back to that for just a moment. Okay, ends are goals or objectives. Correct, Alessandra. And means then are the what? Compared to those ends, the means are what? So good, we know what are ends, goals, and objectives. And so what are those means? Means, the actions that are taken or the methods that are used to get to the goals. Perfect, yes, thanks. So um, the claim that pleasure, happiness is the only thing that we pursue as an end just means, in other words, that um, each one of us is essentially seeking pleasure in our lives. And everything you do is desired as a means to that end. I mean, you're taking this class and other classes. And sometimes when you take the classes, you know, the tasks that you're asked to do, the study, the performance in school is not fun, or sometimes it's even stressful. As I think you guys can understand sometimes, right? But why would you do it then? Well, because you believe there will be pleasure derived from the results of having done that later, like when you get a degree and then a job or whatever. So everything you do is based around your promotion and pursuit of happiness. So if each one is pursuing happiness for themselves, then Mill thinks that seems to be the universal goal of everybody and therefore making more happiness, pleasure rather than less would be the right way to live ethically. So now what I want to do from here, I want you guys to be able to see how this theory could be applied to an actual real scenario. So, um, so she's been on my like, lap the whole time, so I'm just going to kind of put her on the table. Um, let me draw a little graph on the board and you can put this in your notes. And this will just kind of vividly display how the theory works, like in a particular practical situation, okay? So here's a box. And in the box, we're going to place uh, four um, horizontal rows and four vertical columns, which creates this grid of 16 boxes, okay? So now... In the top four vertical columns, I'm going to label four um, pieces of info. And what they're going to each be are four different types of pizza topping option. Okay? I know you guys have probably all had pizza. If you haven't, I definitely would recommend. But all joking aside, who can call out and let me know some different types of popular pizza topping varieties? I need four of them. So put them in the chat, and whichever four that I see first, that are different, I'll label these four columns as such. So go ahead, let me know. Rudy, you're coming right out with ham, mushroom, pineapple, and there's chicken. Okay, so wait, hold on. Ham, like ham without pineapple, I guess, was what you're saying. And then mushroom, that's M. Pepperoni, probably have to include just because of how classic pepperoni is. And then, okay, so I mean, bacon and ham are very similar Therefore, I might want to have a little bit of a different option for the other one. Um, olives, is that the one you guys want to go with? Or maybe, okay, so is it too redundant to have ham in one and then pineapple in another? I usually always think of those two things as going together, but I mean, you guys are the ones calling it out. Um, buffalo chicken, that's a pretty obscure one, though. I don't even know if everyone's had it, so <laughs> it, that matters because I'm going to have to ask, ask people about their views of how each one rates. Um, Okay, whatever. Sausage is a good option because if I put C up here and in your notes later, maybe you'll think that it stands for cheese or something. Um, so let's just go with sausage. And a very interesting option with the feta cheese, Brandon. I'm a person that likes all the weird experimental pizzas, so that's just me. I mean, I like anchovies and all kinds of stuff, but, you know, we're all different. So anyway, let's just say this is ham, mushroom, pepperoni, sausage. Yeah, four different types of pizza. Now... Um, Interesting that no one just called out cheese. I would have thought that might have been one of the first ones, but you guys are perhaps a little bit more of a, a subtle taste and such when it comes to pizza. That's fine. Okay, over here, there's four horizontal rows, okay? And in these four um, blank spaces, I'm going to have to place four names of uh, students from the class. So if you're happy to volunteer, it's not like, you know, there's no pressure on you or awkwardness. All you have to do is basically tell me your views in terms of how you would rate these four possible pizza toppings. So let me know in this chat who's okay with having their name be one of those four names. And then you'll assist me as I explain the example from there. So go ahead. Not all at once, please, but just a few of you. Okay, so I see Kobe. I'll put you here. 
And then I see, uh, let's see, why not um, Jesus? Just trying to jump around a little, like a lot of good options. Alessandra, let's go with you. Make sure I get your name spelled correctly, two S's. Finally, one more. Uh, I know there's enough people already there, so let's just say Angel. Kobe, Jesus, Alessandra, and Angel, okay? Uh, just, just a second too late, Jocelyn, but not to worry. You'll be good to go anyways. So here we go. Now, here's the thing. If you look at these 16 different boxes, notice that each box connects a name with a pizza topping option. So like, for example, this box would be like Jesus pepperoni. This box would be Kobe mushroom. Okay, so now in those different boxes, what we're gonna do are put numbers in. And what the number is gonna stand for, let's just say it's a range between zero and 50. I'm just gonna give you that, that range of, of numbers. And when you give me a number between zero and 50, what it's gonna stand for is the quantity or amount of pleasure that you would derive if that was the choice being made. Okay, so I understand maybe some might say, isn't that a little artificial? How can I numerically quantify the amount of pleasure that I could experience? Like what's the difference between a pleasure score of 35 and 34? You know, 35 units of pleasure versus 34. Well, look, of course, precise numeric values are a little bit hard to assign, but we will just try our best. This is just given so that we have a sense of greater than and less than. So like if you like a topping better than another, that should be reflected in the score, the number that you give me. So like if you liked mushroom twice as much as pepperoni, then the value of this should be like a number that's twice as big as this. And if you have no enjoyment of the thing at all, and it's like a topping you really dislike, then it might be zero pleasure, just no pleasure from that. Or if it was your favorite of all, then you'd max out at 50, right? So, you know, you've heard people say like 10 for 10 would recommend or like whatever. Well, this is similar, but it's zero through 50. And the ratings refer to the quantity of overall pleasure you get from that choice. So to the four people here, Kobe, Jesus, Alessandra, Angel, I want you to look at the four types of pizza right there and really quickly just assess your own preferences. That's all I'm asking you. What are your preferences reflected, represented as a number between zero and 50 standing for how much pleasure that would be given by that choice. Um, we're all different people, you know, and we have different preferences. What my favorite pizza is might be gross to you or vice versa, which is okay. But we're gonna find that out simply by asking the four members here. Okay, so let's start off at the top with Kobe. Kobe, are you with me? Let me know. I need four different values for H, M, P, and S. Ham, mushroom, pepperoni, and sausage. So you could let me know here what you think. Okay, so I see you already, 15, 20, 45, 35. 45, okay, strong preference for pepperoni from you, but sausage is like a runner up. And then we gotta go a little bit further down before you prefer mushroom and ham is your like least favorite of the four. Okay, not bad. <clears throat> cool, so then next we have Jesus. Jesus, where are you at? Let me know about your preferences now. You see Kobe's, what are yours? Four choices, four ratings. What's it gonna be? Let's see. Okay, let me know, okay, good. 25, 10, 50, 50. Okay, so this is an interesting breakdown for Jesus. You are basically have a tie. When it comes to pepperoni and sausage, you're, an, you're ambivalent about that because you, both, you like both of them equally as much and both a lot. After that, if you had to make a second choice, ham is like half as enjoyable or pleasurable to you and then mushroom you seem not to like very much or at least just a little bit. Okay, cool. So then next we have Alessandra and you can let me know now. What do you think? Four, starting left to right. What would be the score you would give for each? I mean, we're making, yeah, so let me know. Okay, so 20, zero. Uh, you just, mushrooms are gross, I guess, to you. 20, zero, 50, and 30. 
So Alessandra, you tell people no mushrooms. Like when people ordering pizza, you're like, can we not get mushrooms? I understand. Anyway, I mean, I actually like mushrooms, so, but we're all different and that's fine. So here we go. For you, ham is decent. It's enjoyable, but mushroom is not enjoyable. And then pepperoni is clear, your clear favorite, followed second by sausage, which there's a significant drop off anyway. Okay, cool. All types of mushrooms, you're just talking about the ones on pizza. There's kind of like the shiitake mushrooms. Is all Anyway, yeah. Yeah, well, there you go. You see, we're different, and that's okay. So next it's Angel. Angel, four things. Let me hear from you. Four types, four scores, and it's on you to just let me know. Okay, 20, 15, 50, and 30. Man, you know, the thing about you guys, it's like, why is everyone, I mean, <laughs> everybody likes the same pizza. It's not as interesting as I would have hoped. But anyway, um, now, if you're a utilitarian, how would you compute what's the right action in this situation here? Um, what's the morally obligatory action? We got to do a little basic math. What mathematical operation do you think that I'm hinting at here? We got to do this, and then when we finish that math, we'll be able to assign the, the morally obligatory action. We have to do what? What do you think? You have these numbers. Okay, add them up. I'm interested that everyone always says find the average. Why the average though? It's about aggregate pleasure. So that's about a sum total. I mean, um, I guess you could find the average and then multiply it by four, but that's two mathematical operations, right? To get an average, you have to add then divide. To get a sum, you just have to add. It's also not the mode, um, but yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd think the median. The mode is the most common uh, value. Um, so, or sorry, the median is the, inter is the center value, the mean is the average, and the mode is the most common. So, I mean, I, I guess those that are thinking the average would, would be talking about the, the mean. But anyway, um, no, we're just talking about simple addition, summation. Also wrong, Alessandra, because keep in mind, utilitarianism says take the action that generates the most overall happiness for the greatest number of people. Overall happiness is a total. So we're going to have four totals at the bottom of these four columns, right? This is an addition problem. One sum, the second sum, the third, and the fourth. And when we see these totals at the bottom, what will the sum represent? It will stand for the total amount of pleasure that would be generated from that option if it were taken. And Leo, I see you're a little ahead of the game, but we have to do the math first. So double check my math, even though it's pretty easy. 20, 40, 65, 80. Okay, mushroom, almost no points. 20, 30, 45, but it is the best pizza, just kidding. Anyway, pepperoni, 50, 50, 50, 150, 195. And then finally sausage, so it's 50, uh, 110, 35, 145. Okay, so based on this breakdown here, what will be the moral obligation? Clearly, I guess you can see, and you've already said it, Leo, it's to do pepperoni. Why though? Not for no reason. It's because this, this action generates the most overall utility for the greatest number of people. It generates more total pleasure than any of the other options that we could compare it with. Now, why do you guys all like pepperoni though? Isn't there one person who would have preferred a different type of pizza? It kind of is almost frustrating. But yeah, um, the thing is, normally in a br breakdown of students, there are some that have different preferences, like different favorites. Um, so like, Okay, let's try it this way. Is there anybody who likes ham better than sausage? No, you guys are so uniform. Like, look at this. Everyone's favorite is pepperoni. Everyone's second favorite is sausage. Um, is that true? Yeah, because this is number one, number two for you. Everyone's third favorite is mushroom except for Kobe. No, sorry. Everyone's third favorite is ham except for Kobe, and then... I guess. So it's like you guys are so uniform in your interests. It would have been better to, for the purposes of my illustration here if we had a couple of people that had different favorites. But anyway, um, because what I'm trying to show you is that utilitarianism isn't just everyone gets their favorite. In some cases, what's the most preferred option for you will be outweighed by the greater good in terms of how much utility is generated for everybody else. Uh, well, yeah, so if you're a vegetarian, then you'd probably prefer the mushroom. Wouldn't that be the case, Naaman? Um, 
and Kobe, you say maybe we should have chosen a variety of toppings. Well, we did though. I mean, there's four of them. Uh, I don't know. So let me just, let's say, add another option. Or let me just play with the values, okay, guys? I'm just going to have to do that. So anyway, this hopefully is clear. This is the optimistic choice. The word optimistic is a term sometimes used in modern discussions of utilitarianism. It's whichever choice dominates the others by uniquely maximizing overall uh, utility or pleasure. So in this choice situation, we have a clear winner. This generates the most total utility, so it's the right thing to do. But I don't have the ability, based on the grid that we have here, to show you how someone is taking one for the team because that's not their favorite. So let's try and not modify the example. So suppose that it's like this. Um, I need to take down 45 points and make this one 50. So 50, 50, 45, 5. Okay. Hey, Seuss, we're going to play a game here. I'm going to pretend you're, you're a unique and different person who doesn't just like pepperoni as much as everybody else. Um, so suppose that you have this grid. What's the optimistic choice? It's still pepperoni because it still generates more total utility given this group of people and their preferences than the other three alternatives compared to it. But in this version of the scenario, at least one person is not necessarily happy about the results. Hey, Seuss, because if we imagine this is his preferences, then although this generates the most total utility, it's his least favorite pizza topping. But that's important to understand because utilitarianism isn't just do what makes the most pleasure for you, the individual. It's assess the total utility or pleasure that would be generated by the various options and all who are affected by the choice and then act accordingly to whichever action generates the most utility. So in some cases where what dominates and is optimistic isn't your favorite, you have to kind of concede, take one for the team in utilitarian theory because the goal, the morally right act, is the thing that generates the most utility for all rather than the thing that generates the most utility just for the one person. Now, I said last time that there are other versions of consequentialism that are different from utilitarian theory. And let me just make a brief mention of one of those siblings of utilitarianism, but that's a little different. Um, another consequentialist view is called hedonism. Maybe some of you have ever heard the word hedonism or have a vague idea of what it means. But I'll just tell you, hedonism is an ethical system which says the right act is whichever act generates the most pleasure, but just for who? Just for you, the one person. So a hedonistic person is just a pleasure-seeking individual that's only concerned with their own pleasure and they're unconcerned morally with anybody else's. So in hedonism, in this breakdown of choices that we have here, um, Jesus would uh, just say, let me get sausage, because that's his favorite and that's the one that causes him the most pleasure. The problem about hedonism, though, is it's really kind of relegated to the sidelines of an ethical theory because um, it's not taken too seriously since it sounds to most people as an invitation to just be selfish, to ignore the needs and interests of other people, and to just do whatever makes you the most happy. Now, ethics is supposed to be about how you ought to act if you're morally enlightened, not how people already have a tendency to act, whether they've ever studied or considered ethics at all. And fair enough, a lot of people do live in a hedonistic way. like. It's just me, number one, is the only one that matters and counts. And when other people's preferences conflict with mine, I'll just stop dealing with them or I'll break away and do my own thing. Um, but, you know, many people would say that that doesn't strike us as like a moral lifestyle, but more selfish and egocentric, the opposite of being moral. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in life, sometimes people will act hedonistically, but the utilitarian theory says that the consequences that we should care about morally are those as they bear on overall human happiness. Um, so again, if we modify the graph just slightly, you can see that in this version, not everyone gets their favorite choice, but that's still the optimistic outcome. Um, okay, now, this is a choice situation of pizza topping selections, and I did that just to keep it easy and not to be too heady. But um, don't get it wrong, like it's not just trivial choice situations like the choice of pizza toppings. Admittedly, the stakes are pretty low here. Um, there's not life and death on the line uh, blood and treasure or anything like that. But if you're a utilitarian and you you follow this as your moral principle, then you would apply it to all this kind of calculation. You would apply to all situations, including the biggest and most impactful. Suppose you're a legislator and a bill comes before your desk and the bill says vote yes or no on this bill. Maybe it says legalize marijuana federally, right, which could come up in the next four years. 
But anyway, suppose that that bill comes to the desk of a senator, they're being asked to vote yes or no. If they're a utilitarian-minded senator or legislator, then they would be thinking these thoughts. Well, suppose the bill were to be passed, how much total happiness would that result in for all members of society that are affected by the new law? And compare that against your estimation of how much total happiness would exist in society if the bill were defeated. And then you would simply vote accordingly to which one you thought would be reflective of the greater overall happiness. Um, if you were a head of state making a decision on whether to launch war, uh, you might game out the, the two scenarios and consider how much total happiness minus pain would be generated if the war was in waged or if the war was not waged. If you were a judge making a sentencing decision or um, a person making a personal decision, who to marry, when to marry, where to live, how many children to have or whether to have them at all, what career to take, what major to select. Um, in all of these different cases, a utilitarian thinker would weigh the options available to them, try and estimate how much total happiness would be the result for all affected by each option, and then act accordingly. So I'm just mentioning that although this choice situation is comparatively trivial, it's certainly that the method of choosing generalizes to all other cases up to and including the, the biggest and heaviest decisions a person can make. Okay, so now you've understood the theory a little bit um, and how it could be applied to a given choice situation. Um, the next thing though, and this is always important in philosophy, is to try and tear it down a bit by showing the objections and criticisms on the other side. Okay, so that's a constant hallmark of really academic thought, but philosophy for sure. Um, and you guys have already been exposed to that a little bit when we study philosophy of religion. It's not like we just looked at arguments for God's existence and then just left it at that. We also wanted to consider all the objections and rebuttals that other you know people might have made and did make. So the whole theory, Alessandra, is utilitarianism, which was mentioned in the previous lecture, but just so you're clear, here's the word. That's also just the name of the writing itself in the textbook, it's just utilitarianism, John Stuart Mill. Um, yeah, so on page, you know, page 77 to page uh, 88, the assigned reading, you'll get it there. No, no problem. So utilitarianism, that was a theory, but now we have to learn objections to it. So maybe with that already on the board, can I sneak this into the left? Objections to utilitarianism. So objections are clearly stated reasons um, to find views as well. One objection to utilitarian theory, which was talked about by Mill himself, in his own um, writing that you, you've been assigned, is this, I'll call it, I'll label it a theory fit for swine. Theory fit for swine. So, um, <clears throat> oh yeah, name it. I guess you requested to be one of the members of the the group that chose pizza earlier. And since you are a vegetarian, you, you would have definitely changed up the calculation a little bit. Because I'm assuming being vegetarian, you would have assigned zero to three of the four options. Because, I don't know, some people say, oh, I'm a vegetarian, but I really miss the taste of meat. But more of the vegetarians that I know um, find it distasteful after you've lost that um, you know, desire for whatever. Anyway, interesting. But back to this. A theory fit for swine. OK, so some learned about his theory and reported back to him, I can't agree with you, Mill, this is wrong, because your theory really, it just sounds more like it's a theory fit for swine, more so than like human beings. Um, let's get clear, what is a swine, just literally? Like what kind of thing is a swine? A swine is a what? <clears throat> That's not the, yeah, it's a pig, right, Kobe, exactly. So literally, we're talking about like a farm animal, like a hog. And um, we're going to develop this, but let's see where your current understanding is. Why do you think somebody would claim of this utilitarianism, which says take the action that generates the most overall happiness or pleasure for the greatest number of people? Why do you think someone would say That's, uh, that sounds like it's a theory for swine, not for human beings, not for people? What is it about the theory or about swine or both that, you know, put yourself in the headspace of someone who's 
refusing to accept the theory because of this reason. Why do you think they claim that it's a theory fit for swine? What is it about utilitarianism that evokes anything having to do with swine? Yes, that'd be cool. Let's see. What do you think? Why would somebody say that, basically, about utilitarianism? What is leading to this way of looking at it? What feature of the theory is this person focused on if they're going to claim that it's a theory fit for swine? Yeah. But what do you think? Let's see. It's okay to have a guess, even if it's, you know, not fully formed. Um, but just seeing what you think. Why could it be that someone heard the theory and said, no, that's not for persons, that's not for human beings? Okay, Kobe, you say pigs being led by, to a slaughterhouse, just groups of people blindly following the majority. Well, Kobe, let me say this. Actually, that's not quite the reason, but I, I want to make sure we're all on the same page about utilitarianism itself. Um, it's not just majority rules, because it could be the case in some situations that although there's a minority that has a preferred outcome, that the pleasure associated with their preferred outcome is more intense than the majority would be, okay? Because in utilitarianism, you're supposed to maximize utility. It's not the same thing as taking votes. Um, to just quickly speak to your point, Kobe, really fast, remember the grid that we had? I'm just gonna make a more simple grid of three. Suppose we have like Larry, Curly, and Mo, three people. Yeah. Not the three stooges, haha. But anyway, suppose that there's like cheese, pepperoni, sausage. Now, if you're asking Larry and Curly, they don't like cheese. And they do like pepperoni and sausage. Okay? When you get to Mo, he has no interest at all in pepperoni and sausage. So what these two things add up to then is 55 and 55. But Mo loves cheese so much. I'm, I'm breaking the rules a little bit and expanding the value range a bit. But in this case, with Mo having 56 units of pleasure associated with cheese, what's the optimific choice here? At Kobe, this is specifically for you, but for everybody else. What's optimific in this case? Which topping? Clear enough. It's cheese, right. But hold on, Kobe, is it the majority that wants cheese? No. It's the minority. It's one out of three that wants it. So why is it the right thing to do? Because it's all about the total in the bottom. It's not about the equitable distribution of these values. So it's possible in theory for like a minority of people um, to derive such great pleasure that even though it's not the most equitable distribution of pleasure, it's still more in total. Like think about capitalism, for example, you might say, well, some people are like this tiny group that have access to so much wealth that their lives are way better than everybody else's. Is that really fair? Someone could argue that maybe if the intensity of the minority group's pleasure is so vast that it outweighs a different status quo where pleasure is more equitably distributed, but it results in a lesser uh, total amount. So that just a small point of correction. It's, it's a subtle thing, but it's something that does come up in these lessons. So I wanted to make a point about it. Um, it's not just majority rules. Now, in many cases, what the majority wants is also going to align with what causes the most happiness. That's how the previous graph was when I actually sampled your guys' preferences about those pizza toppings. But it's not literally impossible for this. In fact, there's a term for this, and that's another possible objection to utilitarianism itself. This man, Mo, in our situation here is labeled the utility monster. So that's a term of art within utilitarianism. The, the utility monster is an individual in a choice situation who's in the minority, but whose intensity of pleasure so overwhelms everybody else's that they basically can get their way. Think of like seeing a film and making a decision with a group of people which movie to see. And three out of four want to watch, like, I don't know, some new action movie. But the fourth person is a child, and the child is obsessed with, like, a new um, animated film. They're obsessed with it. They've been collecting all the memorabilia and promotional materials. They've been waiting anxiously for its release for, like, a whole year, circling the date on the calendar. So suppose that the other three people who are adults will not find this child's movie really interesting. They'll get a little pleasure from it, but not much. And they'd all rather watch just, you know some Marvel Comics movie or something, a little more mature. Um, but the child's intensity of pleasure would be vast. It's like almost euphoric, ecstatic, you know. So in that case, there's one out of four that wants to see it, but it might be a higher intensity of pleasure. Therefore, it could possibly be that that's the utility monster in that situation. Some people find the possibility of the utility monster a, another objection to the theory because um, it could be that minority wins in some of those cases, and some find that implausible. But anyway, I digress. 
back to the question at hand, why do you think that maybe someone called it a theory fit for swine? And so, Rudy, you've also said pigs will take whatever they can get. That's kind of along the right lines. Um, it's basically this, okay? The theory of utilitarianism says that what should you be preoccupied with in life? What should you always be trying to do? You should be trying to create as much pleasure as possible for as many people as possible. But someone might hear that and think this. Why pleasure, though? Why is that the goal and the standard that we should measure all our actions by? Pleasure is not a worthy goal, says the critic. Pleasure is something that maybe animals should be focused on, like, say, a pig. So consider pigs, right? They want to roll around the mud, eat a lot of food, just sleep all day, their whole life fully focused and preoccupied by the pursuit of pleasure. That seems animalistic. That seems bestial to some people. We're human beings. We're better than that, someone might argue. We have a higher and a more noble goal that we should be pursuing than just the base pursuit of pleasure. So the, the critic is basically finding issue, finding fault with the priority placed on the seeking of pleasure in the theory. Like pleasure is a goal that's only worthy of a subhuman creature like a pig. But for a human being, our moral lives should be focused on something more noble and lofty than that. Okay, so that's the objection. But Mill knows about that objection, and he actually himself tries to give a rebuttal to it. So now I will tell you about Mill's reply to that objection. How does he clap back, say something back to the claim that this is a theory fit for swine? Does he just say, never mind, oops, yeah, it is, my bad? No, he is going to defend his theory, right? So he says this, it's not a theory for swine. The only reason people are saying that is because they don't recognize that there are two types of pleasure. Okay, so here's what he says, there are two types of pleasure. Okay, so there are higher pleasures and lower pleasures. Higher and lower pleasures, okay, so um, the higher pleasures are labeled higher pleasures because they are pleasures that only human beings could possibly experience. So only our life form could even understand the things that these pleasures involve because basically it takes a higher level of intelligence and sophistication for something to enjoy such pleasures. So these are um, sources of pleasure that only human beings can enjoy. Sources of pleasure that only a human can enjoy. Lower pleasures are therefore just sources of pleasure that non-human animals can enjoy. Okay, higher pleasures, exclusive for humans. Lower pleasures, lower animals can enjoy those too. Now humans can also enjoy the lower pleasures, but we're not limited to those. We have access to these higher pleasures that the animals cannot touch. So with your help, let's try and think of a few examples of each possible kind. Let's start with the higher pleasures. Think about the fact that you're a human being and think about some things that you can enjoy that no other animal could ever enjoy. No dog, cat, pig, cow, or anything that's not a human could enjoy these things because essentially they are too dumb to know what these things are about or to have even the faintest comprehension of how they could be pleasurable. So uniquely human pleasures, guys, what do you think are some things like that? And whatever you say, you have to make sure that it's not something that any animal could enjoy. So take pride about eating, sleeping, reproducing. Okay, so media such as TV and movies, very good. Anything that has to do with language, even just the communication we're having right now, taking a class in philosophy, this makes no sense to an animal because they do not understand the symbolic content that is uh, used in language. So all forms of language, all forms of study. Jason, you say money. I mean, money is a medium of exchange for goods and services, as we've said. And I guess an animal could enjoy the things that money can purchase. Um, but yeah, I guess if you mean like finance, investment, the pursuit of capital and so forth, that's unique to the human condition because... The whole idea of a marketplace in which currency is used to trade or barter makes no sense to a non-human animal that simply live 
in nature and don't have the ability to um, comprehend that. So yeah, that's another case. Um, driving, sure. I mean, I'm not 100% sure whether or not we couldn't get a grade eight or something to like try to do it, but yeah, um, I've, maybe I've seen some chimps riding a tricycle or something. But yeah, in general, fair enough. Like the, the use of any kind of um, advanced machinery, whether it's a motor vehicle, forklift, um, you know, a space shuttle or anything else, a boat, you know, any of those things, you need a person that's capable of navigating, um, which means they have to understand the physics of the thing and also what it means to do that. And so um, self-actualization, oh yeah, so on Maslow's list, uh, hierarchy of needs, there's like survival, and then there's a couple more, and finally you get to like self-actualization. Sure, um, I guess that would make sense as well. Um, Rudy, having someone tell you they like your outfit, sure, but there's a bigger picture there, right? The whole concept of fashion, um, you know, that's kind of uh, art in a way. And so all forms of art as well fall into this category. You know, it's us who create art, who, um, who take it in and, and find it valuable and interesting. Music, playing an instrument, listening to music, watching a film, understanding what it's about, um, it, um, and manipulate and use it, having uh, satellites, uh, telecommunications devices, and on and on and on. You know, we could also talk about sports, right? Sports involve a highly definite set of rules that are applied systematically to the game. I mean, sometimes animals play with each other and stuff, but they can't play tennis, basketball, soccer, all kinds of stuff like that. Even if they had the posable thumbs needed in some of those games, they couldn't play, let's say, for example, you know, soccer. I mean, maybe you could train a dog um, to do something that looks like that, but it's not the same. So anyways, guys, those are all higher pleasures of various kinds. There are lower pleasures. That is perhaps easy enough. But it doesn't take a human with that high intelligence to enjoy these lower pleasures. So think of your animal friends out there in the world, whether domestic or wild. What kind of things are pleasurable or possibly, you know, sources of pleasure for the lower animals? Lower pleasures. What do you think? Hmm. Yeah, and so academic study is in here too. I mean, you could plug in any subject, literature, science, history, poetry, um, physics, chemistry, whatever. Okay, so Kobe, you're saying like sex, mating. Okay, clearly there's a biological imperative for reproduction for the species to survive. So we have a physiological mechanism which gives a pleasure um, response and that's not unique to humans. Um, that's physiologically seen in many other animals. So that's certainly one. Eating, okay, food, water, you know, um, we need sustenance in order to survive, and so nature, again, provides us with a basic pleasure um, reward mechanism for doing that and securing our sustenance. Sleep, um, sure, you know, you need to rest to sometimes heal, recharge, recover, and that's something that you can relate to, but also animals enjoy sleep. Um, sleep, food, mating, uh, maybe like certain other basic things, activity of just whatever kind. You know, sometimes you see animals running around in field or playing, and, and which would be a source of pleasure. Um, I would say warmth or touch, but it does depend on the animal. I mean, a polar bear doesn't like the warmth. But anyway, you guys understand, there are some lower pleasures. We are capable of enjoying them, but we're not limited to those. There's also higher pleasures. So now back to Mill's critic. The critic is saying this, your theory is all about promoting as much pleasure as possible, but why is that the right way to live? That sounds like the way an animal should live because they can't do anything better than just you know, sit around and eat, sleep, mate, etc. So are you telling me, Mr. Mill, to live the life of a pig? This is wrong. We're humans, aren't we? Well, now Mill's coming back and he says, sorry, but you got me wrong. I did not say live the life of a pig. This critic who's criticizing me must think that when I say let's promote as much pleasure as possible, they must be misinterpreting me and thinking that I mean just the lower pleasures. And now Mill says, no, that's wrong. What I mean is we should pursue and promote all the pleasures that humans are capable of, of, including the higher pleasures, but he even goes further than that. And he says the higher pleasures are in fact even greater and more valuable qualitatively than the lower pleasures are. So he says, um, I'm not telling you to live like a pig. I'm telling you to live like a human being who can pursue and enjoy both the lower and the higher pleasures, but with special focus and emphasis on the higher ones. Because he says by comparison with the lower, they're greater, more valuable, and more pleasurable. Um, so he makes this famous quote based on that statement that the higher pleasures are better and they matter more. He says, it is better to be an unsatisfied human being than a fully satisfied pig. Um, 
It's greater to be Socrates dissatisfied than a satisfied fool. And if the fool or the pig are of a different opinion, it is because they only know their own side of the question, but the other party knows both sides. So what he's saying there is nobody would willfully trade the pleasures that come from the human condition with a more fully satisfied life of a lower animal. Um, sometimes people say this statement, you know, if you've ever had a pet or you know people that do, or even wild animals, you know, sometimes you see them just reclining, sleeping, being fed or eating, and you think, man, that is a nice, uncomplicated, beautiful life. You know, isn't that the life? I, it's so much harder to be a human being, to have to deal with all the complexities of culture, education, language, um, the pursuit of professional and personal goals. Wouldn't it be nice to trade my situation for the dog or cat that I'm seeing? Well, he says, although people sometimes speak this way, they're not speaking sincerely. They're just being facetious. Um, because think about it. If you're really honest with yourself, would you trade your situation for the even most happy life of any dog or cat? If you did, what would you be giving up? You'd give up your ability to talk, to read, to understand anything about the bigger picture of the world that you are in. You wouldn't know anything about history or anything that's outside of your immediate environment. So maybe quantitatively you could find more pleasure, but qualitatively you'd be impoverished because you would lose all the distinctive higher pleasures that come from the human condition. So that's where Mill is saying, I, ref I, re but I refute this criticism. The person saying this is a theory fit for swine misunderstands the theory. They think it means pursue all the animalistic lower pleasures at the expense of everything else. But he's saying, no, that's not what I've claimed. The theory says to promote all pleasures that are possible for humans but especially and with greater attention to the higher pleasures. So that's one objection, theory fit for swine, and how he replies to it by means of the introduction of these two types of pleasure. Okay, there are still a few other objections to utilitarianism, though, aside from this. And um, in my opinion, anyway, this theory fit for swine objection is not the most um, critical for the theory to, um, to face. It's one that I think... Mill has a decent response to with the whole two types of pleasure thing. So these other next two objections are the ones that where I think there actually is a little bit more, um, you know, these are more powerful objections to me. These are the ones that are actually more of a threat to utilitarianism. They're a little more troubling for those that might hold to the theory. So let's try and get two more objections out there. This is still our topic, objections to utilitarianism. Okay, so <clears throat> another one could be this, that it is too demanding at, of a theory of ethics, too demanding on us, too burdensome, too hard. And another objection could be that, and this is the one that I think is the biggest and toughest one of all, you could say that according to the theory, no action, no type of action is absolutely forbidden in principle. Okay, so two more big objections that are, you know, going against utilitarianism. And these ones, I think, are pretty significant, and um, they're a little bit more um, tough for the theory to, to face. Let's go into this one first, I think. It says, no type of action is absolutely forbidden in principle. That's the one that, to me anyway, gives me the greatest reluctance towards utilitarian theory. I mean, I think it is a strong theory in certain ways. There's much that it has going for it. Like it tells us not to only think about yourself, but to take into consideration the interests of other people, all who are affected by your actions. Um, it says each person's pleasure is not to count for more than anyone else's. So we're all in that sense treated equally, but there are these problems and this is the biggest one. So what it says is no type of action is absolutely forbidden in principle. Um, I bet you that most of us think that there are some things that nobody should ever do, no matter what, no matter how much utility that the action could possibly cause or create. But in pure classical utilitarian theory, there's no room to say that an action is outright forbidden or ruled out. It just depends on the case or the circumstances. 
So let's think about this really fast. Um, oh, I see, Jerry, your statement up there of PlayStation 5. Yeah, video games would be another of the higher pleasures that are unique to humans. Um, but I digress. So here, um, question. Is it always wrong, for example, is it always wrong, is it always wrong to lie according to utilitarian theory? Just let me know, is that true or false, that the, based on that theory, it would always be wrong to lie or would it not be? So is lying forbidden in every case based on utilitarianism? Let me know what you think and then we'll go from there. Okay, so you say false, Kobe, yeah. It's um, not always forbidden. It's not always forbidden. So in what type of case do you think a utilitarian would say you're morally obligated to lie, or in this case, lying is the right thing to do. Exactly, good, Brandon. So imagine a situation where telling the truth would generate less happiness than lying would. If that were the situation, then the utilitarian theory would say lying is the right thing here to do. Now, some of you might not find too much fault with that because I guess some have said that a lie that is designed to uh, make things better and not hurt anybody could be like a little white innocent lie that people don't find fault with. Let me give an example. Someone made a meal and they brought it to like a social gathering like a potluck. And um, one of the people there ate this meal and they found it so disgusting and gross, like it was the worst thing they ever ate. Literally, they were gagging and when the person wasn't looking, they, they threw it out because they couldn't stomach it. It's just gross to them. So later on, they're dealing with that person who they like and they just ask them, innocently, hey, what did you think of my meal that I made? I really spent a lot of time on it. I hope you guys liked it. Now, this person has a choice here. Will I tell the truth? Because the truth is it made me sick and I threw it out. But if I tell them the truth, their feelings will be hurt. If I lie to them, though, and say, oh, it was amazing. Yeah, you're, you know, Chef Boyardee, this is great. You're, you know, If I lie to them, um, they'll feel good, and that will make them happy and pleased. So what's right here? Should I lie or tell the truth? Now, in utilitarianism, the answer is clear. Go ahead and lie because that'll make happiness and telling the truth won't. And in that situation, you might say, well, I don't really see if that's wrong. That seems correct. But where does it end is the point. You understand? Like Gordon Ramsay, nice reference. Yeah, like where does it end? Um, what if a person cheated on their partner? And if the partner found out about that, then they would be very hurt. But if they never find out about it, then they feel fine and everyone's happy. So does that mean that you should conceal wrongdoing if discovery of it would make everybody sad? So this looks like an open invitation to just conceal facts from people that make them uncomfortable, even when people are in a position or might have a right to know. Um, so that's an issue with lying. Kobe, you say this, but what if you're the first person to eat the food and they're about to serve the gross meal to other people? Well, that's changing the case a little bit, Kobe, I guess. Um, I didn't necessarily mean to imply that it's dangerous to eat. <laughs> Uh, it could just be that it's got like blue cheese in it or something and this person they have you know those finicky tastes and they think that type of stuff just tastes weird and like you know gross but um yeah i mean if you want to uh, consider a hypothetical like that then maybe that changes the calculation a bit like if it's dangerous for the other members of the party to eat then that might overwhelm your concern for the person's feelings because the total amount of overall happiness dictates what you ought to do and certainly people will be more unhappy being sickened by a meal than one person's hurt feelings. So there's no inconsistency, I don't think, Kobe, but when we modify the case, then that changes the calculus just a bit too. Okay, so um, I said something about lying. What about stealing? Same thing, is it always wrong to steal in utilitarian theory? Well, again, we can't say absolutely 100%. No, it does just depend, once again. Can we imagine scenarios, possible cases, where we would take something theft from a very wealthy person who doesn't even necessarily need it or want it, but by then uh, selling the item, using the revenue derived from the, the sale of the stolen item, a person could donate that to like a worthy cause, like a children's hospital. And now that same like trophy that had been sitting in their trophy room collecting dust has now turned into a bunch of people surviving um, in the third world. Now, that's like a Robin Hood type scenario, right? Steal from the rich, give to the poor, and it creates more total happiness when it's given to that greater good. But where does it end? I mean, you know, we would have no kind of stable system of ownership in private property if we imagine that hypothetical scenario taken to its extreme. So, I mean, again, there are issues here. Let me look at some comments. Brandon, is the total amount of happiness different from total amount of well-doing? Um, I guess I think the answer is yes. Happiness is just how much pleasure you're feeling. So like, I mean, um, it's in a way a little bit hard to quantify, 
But like, say you're bored and upset and mad, you're not feeling as much pleasure and happiness right then as if you're like having a great day and good vibes and you're just positive and happy and optimistic. So um, basically, you have to think about it in this kind of somewhat vaguely defined sense. Pleasure is how much enjoyment you're getting in a given scenario or situation. Well-doing is defined in terms of pleasure in this case, Brandon. So you really can't introduce the concept of what is doing well. In utilitarian theory, just put that hat on for a minute. What it means to do well by definition is to just do the thing that generates the most pleasure for people. So, I mean, I guess intuitively in your pre-theoretical thinking, doing well doesn't necessarily mean creating the most happiness. But if we look at it from the perspective of the theory itself, then I guess there isn't a huge difference. Whatever is doing well is just equal to whatever in that scenario caused the most happiness or pleasure. Um, and then you add this. You may do something to make someone happy, but it could be a disservice to them, I suppose. Sure, and that's something that would have to be considered. You know, I like the way you're uh, adding subtlety to our examples, right? Because I just say, you tell the person their meal is great, they're happy. But I think what you're imagining is this, if I may, Brandon, that by telling them it's good, you prevent them from making necessary changes to the way they prepare food, which might make their cooking better in the future and in the long run of time, even though it hurts to hear this, that will make them happier if you consider the later effects and consequences that come from being notified of how poorly they've prepared the meal. Um, I don't disagree with that possibility at all, but I just kind of omitted those additional details because I didn't want to like, you know, overcomplicate the scenario. Surely though, Brandon, that's a fair point. And if that was, you know, added to the features of the hypothetical, then that might give you pause as to whether or not you really should tell the person this thing. Uh, Sebastian, like when SpongeBob tries to make Squidward happy and ruins his day. Yeah, you know, stuff like that. Maybe um, some people, depending on their temperament or the background circumstances of the case, um, it would not be as straightforward as the one scenario that I gave you at first. But it's good. It's good to consider these other permutations of the example. Um, one more, though, before I move again to the next objection or the last objection. Um, some people might also object because, you know, it says no action is totally forbidden. Well, what about killing an innocent person? You might say that's that's totally out of bounds. We can never say that's acceptable, no matter what, no matter how much total happiness that it generates. But I mean, imagine a situation like this. What if somebody um, knew that there were like five patients that needed organ transplants and there was like one random homeless person out there with a criminal record or something, but you know, they're living free on the streets now. You know, they paid their debt to society and they say, well, this person's got no existing friends or family and they don't contribute anything to the social system. So what if I were to murder that person, take the five organs that these other individuals all need urgently, give them to those five people as transplants and now five people survive and one dies. Now, is that okay? Is that moral? Is that immoral? Most I hope would say absolutely wrong. That's totally not okay uh, because that person had a right to live, you know, despite the fact that more people could have been saved through the transfer of their organs. But um, it's just a little hard for the utilitarian to say, at least initially, why that is wrong, according to their principles. Because if you decline to murder the one, then five people will die of their organ failure, uh, which is a greater amount of total loss of life. If you spare the one, five will die. If you kill the one, five will live. So it seems like if we compare the two alternatives, kill versus don't kill, Killing leads to more survival in that situation than declining to do the same. But obviously, many of us have powerful intuitions that this is a violation of morality. That person has a right to live. So, um, of course, I'm not saying that a utilitarian would be committed to this outcome. They might be able to finesse an explanation as to why, you know, you should uh, not do so. But at, le at least it shows a little bit of difficulty, right? Um, Clearly, those are kind of actions that I think are absolutely wrong, no matter how much utility could be generated. So if you're a strong believer in certain rights, like people have a right to live no matter what, you know, the benefit of killing them could be, um, then there's some aspects of utilitarianism that it's, that it's definitely reasonable to find fault with. Killing a murderer, sure, I guess, but it um, depends on whether they're in custody or not, I guess, right, Sebastian? Because if they're already locked up, then they're not going to murder anybody else. Um, but if you're talking about killing the murderer to prevent them from killing a greater number of people, well, that's a different case altogether. Yeah, like a death sentence, I guess. At the same time, though, when the person's already imprisoned, the necessity of killing them to, to prevent them from hurting others is not necessarily there. In fact, 
utilitarian arguments can go either way on the co topic of the death penalty, which is another interesting application of the theory. Some will say that the deterrent power of the, of the penalty, the death penalty, will prevent more people from committing murder, and therefore, at the cost of those lives of those murderers that we execute, we're saving a greater number because of those that become afraid of facing the ultimate punishment. Other people say, no, it's not an effective deterrent because somebody who commits murder is not thinking rationally anyway, and they're probably already risking their life in the commission of the act. So whatever deterrent power uh, it has seems zero to some, and therefore killing the person is actually less optimistic than allowing them to survive in prison because the person who continues on their life in prison might reform, might come to see the error of their ways, and might be able to derive a little bit of pleasure from the remaining years of life that they have left. I don't know, does this strike against the feeling of security and safety of the victim's family members and friends? These are complex moral issues, so I can't settle them in a simple, uh, quick moment like this, but they're things to consider from either side of a utilitarian point of view. Okay, one more though, too demanding. Let me mention a few things about that. Yeah, no, thanks for those questions, it's very good. Um, some say the problem with utilitarian theory is that it's just too, um, too demanding and too high a bar for us to really live that way. It would, it would ask too much of us. Let me give you some examples. Um, in utilitarian theory, it doesn't say maximize the utility and happiness of those people who you care about, your friends, family members, and, and so on. No, it just says maximize pleasure, period, like for anybody and everybody, regardless of whether you're close to them or you don't know them at all. And so in some cases, that might obligate us, according to the theory anyway, to take actions that are inconsistent with our feelings of loyalty and familiarity with some persons. Like imagine that there was a uh, brush fire that had broken out in a community, and there are two adjacent homes that are both burning and on fire. Suppose that you are on the scene, and you have a limited window of opportunity to act in order to save the occupants of either of bu the buildings. If you go to one of the buildings, then you will run out of time to uh, go to the other. So you have to make a choice. Suppose that this is one factor about the choice. To the building over here on your there is a loved one, a dear loved one that you've known and have a long established relationship with. It could be, let's suppose, a sibling, a parent, or a friend, right? But someone you really care a lot about, who matters to you a lot. That, but there's just one of them, okay? Now in the other house to the right, let's say there's a large family of 10 but they just moved into the neighborhood and you don't know them at all. I'm sure they're great people and they all love each other and they have their own friends and family, but you're, they're anonymous to you in the sense that you don't have any existing relationship with them. Now, if, they, if we had a forced choice like that and a shortage of time in which to act, then what would the utilitarian theory say is your obligation here? Go towards and why? I think if you follow me, you'll be able to say, and this is going to spell out why it seems as too demanding to a lot of people. But help me finish this example. So according to the utilitarian theory, what's the moral obligation for our subject on the scene to go to the house with one or the larger house? Save the family, right, and why? Well, because if you have not got the ability to do both, then in case you go to the side of the one that you really love and know, you're saving fewer people, okay? And fewer people being saved means less total happiness exists after these events because the continuation of 10 lives and all the future happiness that they would otherwise have experienced would be deleted in case they get killed in the fire. And the one loved one that you have, of course this is going to harm you a lot and it's going to be a huge loss for you and of course it ends their life, but um, it's only one as opposed to 10. So, you know, it's just, the theory says like a robot, you know, just my moral obligation is to promote the most utility regardless of the fact that here's one person who I have a much more established relationship with. Now some people, if you're really committed to the theory of utilitarianism, you might say, um, you know, it's hard to do the right thing, and actually that is the right thing. It's just, you know, as much as you love the one person, that's a larger number of people, and when it's human life, you should just do whatever saves as many as possible. But to many others of us, it would sound like this is a bridge too far. These are imposing obligations on us that we could not realistically live up to, because as humans, we naturally form attachments and partial familiarity with some people and not others. So that familiarity, that partiality cannot be ignored, and a moral theory which asks us to ignore it must be wrong itself. So this is another view um, as to why a person might really find fault with it. So if you found any of these objections to be forceful or you know, concerning about the theory, then maybe you will like the alternative that we'll talk about next week, which has a whole different um, set of principles 
than utilitarian theory. And it's considered like the, the rival to it and the competitor to it in the space of competition within ethics. So to those that say, you know, I don't think I would have to, I don't think it would be necessarily a moral obligation to save that bigger group. Or if you feel like it would definitely be wrong to kill that one person to save the larger number in the organ transplant scenario, then maybe you'll find greater favor with um, Kantian ethics, which is what we'll talk about next time. You know, and I guess I'll just close with this. Sometimes when people have to do things that they consider to be necessary evils, is the term that people use, they employ utilitarian style moral reasoning. Like decisions that are sometimes made in war are sought to be justified by utilitarian um, philosophy. So like, say for example, a real example, um, when we dropped the atomic bomb on Japan, the two atomic bombs actually, in, after the attack on um, Pearl Harbor. So that's Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the two bombs, Fat Man and Little Boy. Um, <clears throat> there continues to be, I think, some ethical and uh, scholarly debate about the moral justification for launching those weapons. Um, still today, to this day, the only time that actual nuclear weapons have been used um, against civilians in a war. Um, so I think the consensus view of most American scholars and historians is that it actually, as destructive as it was, was still morally justified. So think about it from a utilitarian point of view. And I'm not saying I agree with this conclusion. You know, it's just a, for the sake of discussion. Suppose that a person thinks that it was morally justified to launch those nukes. Um, what would be the utilitarian explanation for why that was the right thing to do as opposed to not doing it? So imagine those are the two choices, drop these atomic bombs on Japan or don't, back then at that time in that context. What would be the utilitarian argument which says we should drop them? You have to give me the answer from the standpoint of the theory. So the theory gives the ability to say, yeah, it was the right, right decision. So like, what would be the explanation given by a theorist of utilitarianism if that was their view? Like what, what could possibly justify the, the dropping of those two atomic bombs on a utilitarian basis? Okay, Kobe. Saving more American lives compared to sparing the Japanese and risking the soldiers. Well, uh, not exactly, though, Kobe, no, because utilitarianism doesn't say promote the most utility for all Americans. It says create the, promote the greatest amount of overall happiness for the greatest number of people. So you can't refer to um, the nationalist point of view that it's to promote our interests as humans. But you can make a utilitarian argument that for all parties considered, even the Japanese and just the people in the world in general, that it was better. Okay, and that's kind of it, there, there you go, Kenny and Leo. The war, some argue, and this is the argument given by scholars that defend the justification of it, that had we not done this, then we would have had to have a sustained conventional attack like using ground forces. And that could have lasted for so long against the dedicated enemy unwilling to um, surrender that it might have resulted in a longer and more drawn out and therefore more overall destructive loss of life in that longer span of time. So you can argue that as destructive and powerful as the bombs were, like just vaporizing like 100,000 people immediately, that the number would have been even greater if we had allowed the war to continue with no definite end um, and that this was the only way that we could have brought the country to its knees so that it would willfully surrender um, instead of you know, continuing to be hostile and aggressive. So that's the argument that was given. Um, some people, of course, would say the ends justifying the means here is just not right because the means are killing 100,000 people towards the end of stopping World War II. But you see, that shows you that utilitarians have the ability within the theory to justify even highly destructive acts as long as the alternative would be even worse, okay? But sometimes people feel like, you know, um, those acts should just be forbidden in principle, even if you know, the alternative might be worse because we should never intentionally cause the loss of life like that. Think of a situation where like, I don't know, in the Donner Party, you know, like uh, nobody wants to cannibalize a member of their family, but suppose everyone's frozen and there's no passable routes to exit. And now the only way to survive is by like, you know, eating human flesh for some time period until you can finally wait for the weather to change. Um, you know, in the ordinary course of events, that's absolutely wrong and disgusting, but you might say, well, now the circumstances dictate that if we don't do it, more people will die than if we do. So sometimes utilitarianism can be given as a basis to justify actions that would otherwise be very hard to justify. And in each case, the, the argument is that um, the alternative would be even worse. 
Okay, so like, I don't know, shooting an innocent hostage because they're being used as a human shield in front of the hostage taker. And if you don't do it right now, he's going to detonate a bomb that'll kill a big group of people. You know, that's an innocent person. They have a right to life. But you might say, this is a necessary evil because if I didn't do this, even more people would die instead. So that can seem plausible to some. In some other people's minds, it might seem like those are unjustifiable acts and the theory is just trying to provide cover for things that are not okay. But you're the judge right now, and you're the one who can weigh this theory against other available theories and just measure it against your own intuitions. So my job is just to show you it, show you what are the problems that it might have, and then you're left with your own judgment and thoughts from there. So guys, sorry about that. It was just a notification on my desktop here, lap laptop rather. Um, I guess we're at class time, and that's good. We've covered everything on utilitarianism for now. So I'm going to let you guys go, I guess. Let me see in the chat that we're all good. Um, and then I'll just close the stream, and you'll be on to your weekend, I guess. So are we all right? <clears throat> yeah, let me know. Just waiting for your quick reaction. <clears throat> Just let me know we're all good. Basically, that's my question. Just making sure. Don't like to close before I get that. Okay. Perfect, guys. Thanks again. Um, me and Peachy are signing off. Uh, she's just too cute. This cat, I mean, can't get enough. I guess the feeling's mutual. All right, guys. Have a great one. And uh, I'll be in touch. If you need anything in terms of your paper, you're working on a draft, you, you want to ask questions about it, feel free to email me anytime, and I'll try to get back to people who do send me any messages. Okay. Thanks again, guys, and I'll see you soon. Thank you, Janice. Yeah, she's great. Bye-bye. <clears throat>